The delegate from Culpeper, Delegate Freitas. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise for a point of personal privilege. The delegate has the floor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, to anybody that's watching or listening, uh, the rendition that you just heard has become all too familiar from some of our colleagues on the other side of the aisle. Not all of them. I want to make sure that that's understood. But some of them. Because, once again, it's the questioning of the intentions of people that you disagree with on policy. And, and I wonder sometimes, what would it look like if we decided to engage in that same sort of reasoning to our colleagues on the other side of the aisle? And to a point I already know, because anytime we ever get close, there's this righteous indignation with people running off the floor, requesting recesses so they can gather their composure and then come back and once again accuse us of being horrible people if we don't agree with them. I also served in Iraq. And apparently, the delegate and I learned two very, very different lessons. I learned the lesson of what happens when a government systematically disarms its people and leaves them completely vulnerable to both criminal and terrorist activity. It's one of the reasons why, when we were over in Iraq, we actually went to the trouble of making sure that they did have the ability to defend themselves because we knew we couldn't always be there, that the Iraqi army couldn't always be there, the Iraqi police couldn't always be there. And we understood because we saw the results of what happened when people were actually empowered to be able to defend themselves. Now, I understand that our colleagues on the other side of the aisle take the position that when someone abuses their right, that perhaps the best way to address that is to diminish the rights of everybody that didn't abuse it in the hopes that maybe it will somehow deter the person that has already made up the decision to engage in a violent act. That's a claim. That's a hope. But here's what you're actually doing. And this part is very, very important. Because if we do actually believe in a free country, then we need to understand something about rights and the nature of them. If you tell a bunch of people who did nothing wrong, law-abiding people, people who have used a firearm in order to defend themselves, if you tell them, we're going to make it more difficult for you to get it, or we're just going to ban them outright, or, as the delegates bill did, we're going to make you a felon and take away not only your gun rights, but your voting rights, if you have so much as a 15-round magazine. If you're going to tell them that, then understand something. You will, guaranteed, make it more difficult for those people to be able to defend themselves. They will be completely reliant upon the government to provide for their security. So when someone is kicking in their door, when someone is robbing their store, when the domestic abuser comes back, they will have to call the police and patiently wait. And if the police don't get there in time, I guess our colleagues on the other side of the aisle will be able to say, well, at least there wasn't any gun violence. Because let's understand something about the way that they actually gather their statistics, and this is very important to understand. If you did have a situation where a woman had a firearm in order to protect herself because she has a husband or a boyfriend that is beating her, and he shows up one night drunk and she shoots and kills him, that will go into the general statistics of gun violence. Now you take the gun away from her, he shows up, beats her to death, their gun violence statistics just improved, didn't they? Because the gun wasn't used. What we are interested in on this side of the aisle is confronting violent people that engage in violent acts against innocent people. That's why you will see several bills today and through the rest of this session making sure that people that repeatedly break the law, whether they use a gun, a knife, their fists, a car, we don't care. If you're a violent person and you're perpetrating violence against an innocent person, we want you to be captured, prosecuted, and go to jail for a long time. We don't want them to get out on all kinds of credits like some of our friends on the other side of the aisle do. So this idea that we have no response to violence, to gun violence, is verifiably false, and yet it is repeated over and over and over again. Because I honestly believe at this point, our colleagues on the other side of the aisle don't want to have an honest debate about this. What they want to do is try to convince anybody that's watching that we're just evil, mean, bad people. 
And there's no reason to listen to an argument from an evil, mean, bad person, right? It's just purely ad hominem attack, dressed up as an argument. That's all it is. Because the idea, the offensive notion that the people on this side have never been touched by violence, by gun violence, that we don't understand that is absurd and again, verifiably false. The difference is, is that our solution is when someone does a bad thing, we go after the action, we go after the person, we don't go after the rights of innocent people who did nothing wrong and those who just want to defend themselves. So that is the distinction here. It is not a question of one side wanting to do something and the other side wanting to do nothing. It's a question like so many other things. Are we gonna do everything we can to protect people in a free society and to allow them the ability to protect themselves or are we gonna summarily disarm, punish and felonize them, leaving them sometimes at the mercy of their attacker also, you can come back here later and say, well, gosh, at least we did something. After all, the gun violence statistics are down. Well, I have news for you. When the hundreds of thousands of Americans every year who use a firearm, sometimes all they have to do is show it. Sometimes they have to actually use it. When those people are going to be denied their rights by your policies, you bear far more responsibility for what happens to them than somebody that decides to abuse their rights. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.